You probably have stocks and bonds in your portfolio, but have you considered farmland? I'm Jack Otter, editor of Barons.com. I'm here with John Taylor from U.S. Trust. You are the leader of the farmland business at U.S. Trust, a business that most people probably don't even know U.S. Trust is in. Uh, but before we talk about that, let's just talk about the investment case for farmland. Why would someone want that as part of their portfolio? You know, Jack, that's a great question. Um, I think <clears throat> the main thing is it's, it's got a very low correlation with the market. Okay, and um, you know, over the last few years, I think that's one of the lessons we've all learned is if you can get something that's not correlated with the market and really will diversify your portfolio, that's a great thing. The other thing is, um, you know, if I kind of talk in the portfolio speak, it's got an asymmetric risk curve on the downside, right? So, what do we mean by that? Well, a stock can go to zero at some point in time, and you know, a bond can go to zero. Land can't. Okay, so can land go down? Absolutely. We've can seen land? That recently. We have, but can land? You, you've never seen a sign that says, you know, we no longer want the land come by my kitchen table, my wife, and I'll sign you the deed. You know, because it goes to zero. Doesn't happen. So asymmetric risk curve on the downside. The other interesting thing on farmland is there's no vacancy factor, and I know in New York that probably catches some people, you know, a little bit by surprise because you think about high-rise buildings, or you think about retail, or you think about malls and all of them tend to have some type of vacancy factor. Good farmland doesn't. Good farmland is farmed every single year in the U.S. So you've got a very stable income stream. Can that income stream vary? Certainly as, as prices go up of commodities, you know, those rent payments can go up. As prices go down, they can go down a little bit. But again, they don't go away. They don't go to zero because farmland is leased every single year. So I think it's a stability of a current yield. And unlike a bond, a yield that can rise over time as commodity prices rise, so it's like got a little bit of an inflation hedge. And then similarly, the land value has some of an inflation hedge. Well, certainly you have uh, a lot of good people advocating farmland. Jeremy Grantham, for one. Also, Warren Buffett recently had an article uh, in, in Fortune. Now, he was really making an analogy to how to be a stock investor, but he owns right. farmland and, and likes that investment. How did U.S. Trust get in the business? Yeah, it's a great question because I think a lot of people are surprised when they find out that, you know, Know, that we're in farmland and that we manage it. Oddly enough, we're probably one of the largest fiduciary managers, if not the largest fiduciary manager of farms and ranches today. So if you look at U.S. Trust today and all the predecessor trust departments that are today a part of the U.S. Trust franchise within Bank of America, we find that we've managed farms and ranches for over 60 years or right around 60 years. Um, I've got 16 full-time farm and ranch managers today. We manage 900 50 properties give or take it's probably you know over 1.2 million surface acres and over a billion dollars in market value so that's the kind of the aha moment so we didn't just get into this to say you know farmlands an interesting space we've been managing farms and ranches for our clients for a number of years and I think as as farmland beca became more and more um, you know, on the radar as an investable asset class, it was very easy for us, having managed this, to take that next step. Now, uh, obviously, we're talking about wealthy investors here. Correct. This is uh, not an easy thing to get into, and you don't buy shares like you're buying shares of Apple or IBM. That's true. You know, we've got a lot of the farmland guys that work for me, and we'd all love to invest in farmland, but we're just not quite at that stage yet because it is a direct investment. So it is for our, our, our very high net worth clients because it's not a pool fund. It's a direct investment in farmland. And then so what's the entry level here, more or less? Typically what we look for is a $5 million minimum. That usually lets us get them a couple of good farms. Typically today, if you're looking at it, you know, you're, you're probably going to want to buy a farm in the 2 to $2.5 million range. You can certainly buy them for more than that, but we at least want to get a couple of good farms, um, you know, so that kind of it starts at the $5 million level. Now, uh, there has been some talk, uh, this, this is, we're not the first people to talk about this investment. There's been talk that maybe there's a bubble going on here. I was reassured recently when I saw Harry Dent saying it's overpriced. If he's saying that, it's probably <laughs> very safe. Uh, but, but still, address that issue. You know, prices have gone up nicely. Have they gone up too far too fast? They have. You know, I, I got asked that question. Um, we were at a DTN Ag conference at, uh, in, in December of last year, and it was more of the, just the producers and a lot of the farmers and folks that were there and was speaking to some of those guys in one of the in, in one of the discussions and, and really what we see is I think you've got a bifurcated market. 
and you probably have for the last two to three years in farmland. 70% um, of the farmland last year roughly was bought by farmers, not by investors. And so when you look at what we're paying for farmland versus what some of those farm, the, the farmers are paying, there's probably a 25% differential in a lot of cases. What we would say is a premium. The way we buy farmland is <laughs> I look at... the farmers say ripping off a city guy. <laughs> no, I mean, they, they look at it and, and I understand. I mean, they go, well, I've got, you know, 1,500 acres, this 80-acre track right by my fence line or, uh, you know, within a quarter of a mile from me is coming for sale. They will pay a premium for that because it comes for sale maybe once in their lifetime. And it's a chance to add to their acreage. They kind of look at it, well, I know I've paid a premium, but, you know, if I average it in with all the rest of my land, it doesn't matter. I have to be much more disciplined. I have to look at what amount, of, what I can pay dollar per acre for that acre of ground and what I can lease it at because I want to drive a cash return. Our, our view is that we should be able to drive at least a 4% net net cash return, net of our fees, property taxes and insurance back to you know our client's account. So we have to be very disciplined about what we will pay, not emotional on, the, on, on looking at the dirt. The neighboring farmer does. And, and if you think about, if you go back two or three, four years, we've had some historically good years in the farming community, so the, the farm income has been up and they've deployed a lot of that cash. Now that commodity prices have, you know, moved back down a bit, I don't think you're going to see as much cash chasing those premium prices. So hopefully that, that kind of bifurcated farm market tends to close and comes back more to you know, the way we've been paying for farmland versus the premiums, which we could just never justify. Gotcha. And finally, uh, we will point out that this is an, an investment that not only has some capital appreciation, but nice income. And that's one of the it reasons does. it's attractive. And the interesting thing, <clears throat> we have tended to focus on a cash lease. You can do a crop share lease, which was historically the norm. Now cash leases are probably more the norm. And a cash lease, by that I mean literally I'm renting the dirt. Okay, But on a cash lease, I've moved the weather exposure and I've moved the commodity price risk to that tenant. So I've taken two big pieces of risk out of the equation. And on that cash lease you get the same rent, you know, typically we'll do a three year lease so each of the, those three years you're going to get a fixed rent. Then you renegotiate that lease three years down the road. So if prices have moved up, that rent can move up. So that's the other part. You can, over time, if you look at the long-term trend of commodities, which have, which have tended to move up, those cash lease prices will move up. So that yield will keep pace with inflation and, and keep the same kind of ratio that it should have with the underlying value of the dirt. John Taylor, thanks very much. Thank you very much.